Buenos dias, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. Glad to see you. It was a cold and gray morning, wet with rain here in Los Angeles for once. It was a great atmosphere for uh, reviewing this book today, this uh, depiction of an era gone by, uh, the savage beginnings of American rock and roll in this magnificent little novel. Save the Last Dance for Satan by Nick Toshis. Fuck yeah. Have you ever wondered about the intersection of organized crime and rock and roll in the music industry? Maybe you, maybe you don't know anything about it. Maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe you've heard like little whispers of you know people like uh, Frank Sinatra or um, Dino's ties to the mob and stuff like that. Maybe you wouldn't have guessed it. Maybe you grew up. Maybe you're like 50 or older and you kind of like grew up through that era and you just uh, you know you you lived it. You know about it and you really don't care any. You don't you don't care anymore. You know all about it. Uh, but I'm gonna wager. If you're watching this channel, you're probably a young young person, young guy or gal who is really not acquainted with that much old rock and roll, that much old pop from the 50s and the 60s. You might know a little bit about it. You might have heard the, the you know the oldies on the radio, but more than likely, this is probably an entirely new world to you. Something, you know, an era that seems uh, ancient and foreign, might like Rome, right? You know, uh Fuck you! Fuck you! An, an era of music that seems totally foreign and ancient, you know, not to speak of, you know, Italian and Jewish mafias or, or mobs, you know, with their, uh, their, um, their feuds and their rackets and their legends and their own stories and histories. You know, I don't know what that was. It was just an East Coast thing that just kind of took over. If Nick Tosh just had an egg for every guy who described his writing style as hard-boiled, he'd be pretty fucking sick of eggs. Toshis is an American author who was born in Newark, New Jersey. Wrote for Rolling Stone, has always been a rock and roll and kind of like weird, odd record aficionado, and possesses a deep, great, vast knowledge of American music history. Known for his biographies, including that of Jerry Lewis and uh, Dino, uh, the Dino one I reviewed about a year ago was magnificent. Uh, he also, you know, he also writes fiction. He's written a couple of novels. One of them, the, the, the latest one, was called Under Tiberius, which is in the mail. I'm coming, because I forgot about it, and I picked it up uh, uh, yesterday because uh, it's, it's about, you know, it's, it's a fictional novel about how uh, Jesus was essentially invented, or, or much of the, the stories of Jesus was invented by the, uh, the Catholic Church. And I can't wait. There's a horrible, gross simplification, but we're going to see. But In the Hand of Dante is a magnificent novel that I will, will review in the future as well. You know, among his biggest fans, he can count Anthony Bourdain and Johnny Depp. You know, the latter Mr. Depp has the, uh, the option rights to adapt In the Hand of Dante into a film. It's kind of like what it seems it would be something like The Godfather Meets the Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. It would be fucking amazing. I haven't heard much. I haven't heard anything. Uh, uh, regarding updates on that, but uh, I hope that in the future we will see that. Anyways, so if old rock and roll and crime novels are not your thing, I'm afraid you're gonna have to sit this one out, baby. One of my granddads, rest in peace, Bill, was a uh, shoe salesman in New York City in the 60s, I think, and he was probably putting shoes on the stinky feet of a lot of guys mentioned in this book. He had that kind of East Coast grit that just stains the pages of Nick's writing like nicotine. Hard drinking, hard smoking, TV's always on, and putting out your cigarettes in the morning eggs. My mom always told that story because it just it grossed her out so much. It just, like, traumatized her. It's great, but that image is great. That's so fucking 50s and 60s. Putting out your cigarette indoors in your eggs. There's this place up uh, near Los Feliz here in L.A. called Sweeney Todd's. Old school barber shop. You can go and get a straight razor shave. And you can uh, hear the old 50s rock and roll on the radio, and there's framed posters of, uh, or framed pictures of Dean Martin and uh, Frank and the Rat Pack and Frankie and all that. And uh, you know, I like to go out there because I just like to talk to the owner, Sween, uh, great guy with like these old school tattoos, kind of like this John Waters mustache and this lacquered hairdo, totally badass. And uh, it's just an old school barber shop, and you know, he always has yeah, you know, a music recommendations and. Uh, uh, I went up there and I was I think we were just talking about like LA punk bands from the 80s like you know the cramps and, or both well, the cramps are East Coast but we were talking about stuff like the gun club or the blasters and all of that but um, 
Uh, we got on the subject of Nick Tosh's, I think, because uh, Dino, I took a look at the, the picture of Dino, and we, we started talking about Nick Tosh's, and he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, he's great. Uh, you know what I got here that you can buy? And I was like, what? What the hell is that? He's like, this book, Save the Last Dance for Satan. I was like, man, I never knew, like... That's the first time I've bought a book, let alone a badass book, in a barber shop. I mean, that shit, that shit made me like, that was like, this is the greatest. I'm never getting my hair cut anywhere else. And so, you know, it's totally dope. And uh, yeah, go check them out. Tell them Cliff sent you. I've always been a huge fan of old rock and roll and R&B and jazz and pop, you know, from the 50s and the 60s. And I grew up, you know, listening to that kind of stuff on the oldies stations. You know, I was like, well, yeah, man, this is great. Though I never had a proper inter introduction. Though I never had a proper introduction, and I think, you know, I would never be able to actually hold my own in a conversation about it, especially with, you know, an aficionado or somebody who, or somebody who really lived through the era. Um, and I don't think I would be alone in that case. It's not a good or bad thing, it's just a thing. I would only get the snippets from these old radio stations when I was a kid, and I always wanted, like, a voice to guide me through and, you know, take me to the good stuff. Because this world was something I didn't have access to. I needed someone, an older brother figure, or a crazy eccentric uncle. A voice of wisdom, someone who possessed the obsession. Who loved that era, who cherished that era enough to enlighten me on the, you know, the essential artists and tracks. Lo and behold, if you like old school 50s rock and roll, Nick Tosh's is that voice. So the best part of this review is that I've compiled a playlist on Spotify for you to listen to. I'm giving it to you. There it is. Almost 50 tracks listed in this book, straight from the book. You can check it out. And some stuff I even added in, like, you know, on my own. I added in, like, Joni Re Jody Reynolds and uh, Joe Clay, which Sween recommended, and uh, Hazel Adkins, who's just a total badass. That's definitely, like, a Halloween, you know, uh, listen you know, I mean, if you like the Misfits or you like the Cramps or any of that stuff, you gotta go check out Hazel Adkins. It's essential. Sween was actually telling me the story of this woman he knew who had like a, she had like his record and she had like a, like, like this little baggie that she showed him that was like, it was like locks of Hazel Adkins hair. It was totally weird. I mean, it's got everything in this playlist, everything, including the, the MP3, the track from the rarest rock and roll record of all time, which I will gladly discuss right now on page 72 jubilee records founded in washington dc in 1946 by herb abramson mm. and taken over by jerry blaine in 47 epitomized the scattershot approach of the mongrel labels record buy or lease anything you could get it out there and see what shook Jubilee put out records by the Delta Rhythm Boys, Charlie Mingus, essential jazz listening for those of you who want to get into it, Enzo Stuarti, the Oriolis, and a slew of characters who specialize in risque party records. The rarest of all rock and roll records, the example of scattershot and negligence par excellence, was released nominally by Jubilee in 52. Stormy Weather by the Five Sharps. How appropriate for today in Los Angeles. Stormy Weather indeed. Of which only one unbroken 78 RPM copy is known to exist. And is now valued <laughs> and is now valued at more than 50 grand. So the book is structured in a series of journalistic vignettes detailing all of these characters, the releases, disc jockeys, record producers, and of course the musicians themselves, and all this kind of like sordid and shady people in organized crime or not who knew them and were involved with them. Like I said, it comes with dark stories of the music business, its ties with organized crime, subterranean layers of sex, corruption, addiction, and excess, and a little bit of murder here and there as well. There's a lot of stuff going on behind those pop songs, man. This is like some real tough guy shit. Like some wise guy kind of like fucking shoot him up, you know. It's stranger than fiction. And it's Tasha, so you know it's going to be good. It's going to be really well researched and it's going to be totally without fucks. As it starts off, page one. Yes, it was a time. It was a time, all right. So anyway, this character, this punk of a disc jockey from Chicago ends up working here in New York. We have this record. Nice little record. We need to break out the record. This is back in 62 or so. It was pay for play. 
That's what promotion was all about. A hundred, a few hundred bucks, five hundred, a thousand copies of the record that they could take down to the store to sell. So this disc jockey, he's like a midget, this guy, about four and a half feet high. I guess he figures he's a big shot. He takes the money, but he don't play the record. What he does, he goes on the air, says, I'm about to break this new record. And then he breaks it. I mean, breaks it. Cracks it into pieces, says, I wouldn't play this record if my mother gave it to me. Like I say, I guess this little prick thinks he's something. Maybe all that candy-ass Chicago tough guy shit went to his head. Anyway, he wasn't in Chicago no more. This was New York. That's the best way to start off a book, man. Anyways, they take that midget disc jockey and they hold him upside down by his feet outside the window. And uh, they shake him and all of his change falls out onto the sidewalk and all the boys collect it. And uh, that's the kind of like shit was, that was like going around, and like they would just go to these like record companies or these radio stations, and they like, you know, people in the music industry, they like fuck each other up, they like rough each other up. It was like you know, gangs of uh, pr promoter boys or whatever. You know, it's a, it was a different time, man. Yes, it was a time indeed. The voice I hear, you know, in my head when I'm reading this is of course Edward G. Robinson. You know, the tone is like something out of a Raymond. Chandler novel, or Herbert, Sel Herbert Selby Jr., and uh, uh, actually Herbert Selby Jr. has a little quote on the back here. Nick Toshis is such an extraordinary writer, he could write about the Staten Island phone book and make it interesting. It is the vastness of Nick Toshis' heart that makes it possible to reveal the darkness. I feel speechless in the face of such perfection. Totally appropriate, beautiful quote. But, uh, you know, yeah, definitely the tone of Raymond Chandler, the, the you know tough guy, wise guy sort of like thing going on, and um, you know the look of it is totally uh, film noir, classic double indemnity film noir, cloaked in shadows and layered with cigarette smoke. You know this this era gone by, this thing that does not exist any longer. You know this is a New York City that I'm told existed, but I'm, I'm, I certainly was never um, exposed to, and never will be. You know. Uh, it no longer exists. New York City is something completely different and barely any trace remains of what that thing once was. This is one of those traces. There's very few of them, from what I gather. So if you thought 2016 was a wild party, you ought to check out 1965, my friend. You know that song, Why Do Fools Fall in Love by Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers? And if you don't know that song, well, why don't you? Well... Here's the thing about Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman was 25 years old when he overdosed on smack on the floor of his grandmother's bathroom in the Bronx. Celebrating a brand new record deal, he had decided to take heroin after being clean from joining the army for like three years or something. Why do fools fall in love is the strangest listen after you know that. Another junkie you might not know about, Dion from Dion and the Belmonts, you know, run around Sue. Oh, great song. Or The Wanderer, any of that shit is amazing. Um, yeah, survived, but what? But yeah, definitely uh, on on heroin. As he writes in the book, success kills more men than bullets. I saw a photo uh, photo book recently from uh, Larry Clark at this gallery over in Boyle Heights. Uh, it was uh, you know the Tulsa, the book Tulsa. You know Larry Clark. If you don't know, he's a director who made uh, Kids, the mid '90s movie about AIDS and teenagers having sex with each other in New York and all this. And it was incredibly dark film, brilliant film. A young Chloe Sevigny, written by Harmony Korine, his first film that he wrote. Uh, great collaboration, great cast, excellent score, fucking incredible, like seminal, like ultra, like you know real life kind of. Neo Cassavetian, you know, cinema verite, intense, very raw, really vicious, highly recommended, totally holds up today. Tulsa was this book that launched Larry Clark into notoriety as an artist, as a photographer, and it was basically all these kids that he was hanging out with, and you know, including himself, you know, he was very much a participant, you know, shooting up, having sex, shooting things, shooting and shooting up, basically, you know. Uh, there's like pictures of guys with bullet wounds, or you know. Some people have like argued that it's like kind of like gla like a glamorous depiction of heroin use. I don't think so at all. You could take one look at the photos and realize no, it's it's going to be the exact opposite. Point B: Heroin's been around for a long time, man. Like even when everybody was like putting on a smiley face in the '50s and the '60s, 
this shit was dark. I mean, it was, it's the same, it's the same cycle, you know. I think like he said, he said he had a quote about it. He's like, once the needle goes in, it doesn't come out. So this host of characters in every chapter, these, these, a new character in almost every chapter. You have um, the Philly DJ, the uh, Geeter with the Heater, uh, Jerry Blobbit. Totally had all sorts of connections to the mob. Angelo Bruno, who had since Jerry's childhood treated him with the love of a father, was murdered on March 21, 1980, reputedly in a killing arranged by his so-called consigliere, Antonio Tony Bananas, Capa Negro, who himself did not see the end of that year. Capa Negro's naked body, tortured and mutilated, was found in a garbage bag in the South Bronx. Stuck up his dead asshole with a $20 bill, not quite the desserts of avarice that the decedent had envisioned. Phil Testa, the chicken man from Bruce Springsteen's Atlantic City in the very first line, well, they blew up and chi they blew up the chicken man in Philly last night. Phil Testa. That is the chicken man. Phil Testa, who had overseen his justice, took control, but his rule was not long. In March of 1981, the pieces of him were blown into the street by a remote control bomb planted in his South Philly home. It was then that the little Nicky Scarfo, who, after stabbing a man to death in the dispute over seating in a restaurant, had been banished by Angelo Bruno to Atlantic City, there we go, seized Philadelphia, which he held until 1991, two years after his conviction for murder had rendered him a lame duck boss. The murder of Angelo Bruno was when the walls of the neighborhood came tumbling down. It was Blavitt to whom Bruno's family turned to help keep Bruno's funeral from turning into a media sideshow. With the help of a bunch of his young neighborhood fans, Jerry did his best to keep the television ghouls and their camera crews the horrors of newspaper journalism and the necrophagus of every kind at bay. Seen with the mourning family during the previous days, the Philadelphia Daily News ruminated in print on the eve of the funeral. How far the Bruno Blavitt friendship goes isn't a matter of public record, but sources say Blavitt, yes of course, that invisible species, sources, upon which is built all the news that is fit to print had been seen on numerous occasions over the last year chauffeuring Bruno around in his orange Cadillac. Yeah. So how much, we don't know, but it is very interesting to see, like, you know, and Jerry Blavitt, you know, the, the very famous uh, American DJ, you know, responsible for, you know, just look him up. Uh, heater with the Geeter. Uh, geeter with the Heater, excuse me. But um, uh, got a start on American Bandstand, you know. All smiles, man. High Weiss is another character, a record producer of Old Town Records, another another character who kind of like looms large in the in the, the lore of this, and uh, it got some great stories. I'm gonna read one of them too. One of my favorite High Weiss stories was told to me by Billy Miller of Norton Records. It was early not early August, 1992. I get this call, says Billy, at eight in the morning. This guy's screaming at me. You're fucking with my masters, huh? What? Who is this? Hi Weiss, Old Town Records, you're fucking with my masters. He told me that we had put Big Mary's House by the Solitaires on one of our albums. I pointed out that this wasn't the case, but he just kept going. Don't give me that, I've heard all this shit before. You're fucking with my masters. Mr. Weiss, I can look into it, but I'm positive we never released anything by the Solitaires or anything that was on Old Town. Yeah, yeah, right, you don't know who you're fucking with. I can look into it, but you do that. I'm gonna call you back at four o'clock, I want some answers. I was telling him the truth, and I realized he was not talking about something Norton had released, but instead it was an album on another label that we had only a few copies of that we had purchased from a distributor. Shortly after Highwise's call, we received word that Miriam's father had died that morning. I had family matters to attend to, so I, I didn't look into where I'd gotten the album from the solid, with the solitaires from. Four o'clock sharp, the phone rings. Well, Highwise, still mad as hell. I'm sorry, Mr. Weiss, I can tell you this album with your... I'm sorry, Mr. Weiss, I can tell you this album with your track was something on another label that wasn't ours. Whose is it? Mr. Weiss, again, I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to track down any information. We had a death in the family since you called. My father-in-law passed away. Suddenly, he did a complete about-face and became the sweetest guy in the world. Oh my. How old was he? Had he been ill? I told him no, it was sudden, outside his apartment in Florida. Illness, death, and Florida. I hit on something bigger than the solitaires. High was now speaking calmly, and he was very concerned. He wanted to know if my wife was okay. Please pass along my condolences to the family. And then he closed with, Look, you seem like a nice kid. Let me tell you. Records like these tend to have babies. So from now on, just be careful who you deal with. 
it makes you wonder what the hell is going on in the world of pop and rock music behind these doors today. Actually, come to think of it, if we were to judge by the sound, probably not much. Anyways, I'm going to read the ending for you. I love the ending so much that, you know, if you don't make it to it, here it is. I just think this is magnificent. Another day, I'm with Vassal, Weiss, and other characters. Freddy has gone back to L.A. These guys are saying what he said in their own ways. Dead. All of it, somebody says. They took away the prize. Yeah, as Wassel says, intoning agreement with nothing but merely dismissal. No more stand-up guys anymore. It is a once common complaint, heard ever more rarely. Testimony, perhaps, of its increasing truth. This city's dead. This guy, this mayor, this fascia de morte. Here, he's... The speaker shakes his head. Not for want of words, but in disgusted validity. He hasn't been to jail in a while. I tell him... I tell him of an arrest less than a year ago. The first time I was ever in a cell without a single obscenity scrawled on the walls. The walls were filled with only two phrases, in hundreds of hands, a hundred intensities. Kill Rudy and die Rudy die. The notion seems to please all at table and inspires Wassel to speak up again. Yeah, same tone. People say this guy's like Mussolini. They say he's like Hitler. I tell him no. Mussolini and Hitler had friends. Even High Weiss grins. Then he leans forward, softly says, You know why the government will never get the music business? It's because they could never understand how it works. And you know why that is? It's because the people in the music business have never understood how it works. Then High Weiss, a boyish gleam in his 76-year-old eyes, returns quite calmly to his eggs and his coffee and his silence. Always remember that life is far too short to listen to or read bullshit. Please subscribe if you have not already. If you haven't, why not? It's easy. Just do it. Two clicks. Come on. Please go check out that playlist on Spotify. I think you guys are going to love it. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great night. Take care of yourselves. Ciao!